Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you in-depth conversations with the brightest minds in defense, security, foreign policy, and international relations. Each week, we delve into the most pressing issues facing our world today. Our esteemed guests from policy, academic, think tank, industry, military, and government backgrounds offer unique insights and analysis that you won't find anywhere else. Get ready to expand your knowledge and engage in thought-provoking discussion with us. Former Governor General David Johnson has recommended against holding a public inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian politics. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has stated that the government will follow Johnson's recommendations, despite calls from opposition parties for an inquiry. Joining us today to discuss Johnson's finding, including the implications of the decision not to hold a public inquiry, we have Christian Luprecht, Professor in Leadership, Department of Political Science and Economics at RMC, GSPIA Senior Fellow, Arthur Wilczynski, and Thomas Janot, Assistant Professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. This is the Expert Series. Dr. Luprecht, thanks for accepting our invitation to speak on the podcast. Great to have you. Perhaps you could begin by providing some context for our listeners. Can you briefly explain some of the most crucial or significant events leading up to this week's report from David Johnson? So as Canadians will be familiar, there's uh, a host of questions that were asked about um, specifically interference in uh, previous elections by an authoritarian, hostile state actor, that being China, um, and those um, allegations compounded uh, in recent months. And uh, the um, uh, Prime Minister had a host of options to respond to this, uh, including reports by the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians from 2019 that laid out a host of options, a report by Dominic LeBlanc that laid out a host of options Uh, But rather than pursuing any of those options, the Prime Minister uh, chose to um, take action or avoid taking action on calls for uh, transparency around the issues uh, that had been alleged. And so the, um, and and his response to those allegations uh, was to call what he describes as an independent special rapporteur. Uh, uh, to engage specifically with the question of whether a public inquiry is warranted and whether a public inquiry would be useful into this matter. Um, the, um, uh, there has been from the beginning, uh, of course, questions raised about the independence of that rapporteur. If the rapporteur was to be independent, as I've stated repeatedly, one would have expected the Prime Minister to reach out to the opposition parties and to reach a consensus on who that individual might be. The Prime Minister opted not to do that and to appoint someone unilaterally, uh, which necessarily uh, left the impression of partiality, rightly or wrongly, from the outset. Uh, And the Prime Minister appointed someone with no prior expertise on national security matters, Uh, but someone who, at least in perception on the one hand, uh, had been seen close to uh, the Trudeau family, and on the other hand, uh, had decades of uh, sympathetic and friendly relations with China. Um, So we had a special rapporteur who was at least perceived as being not independent, close to the prime minister, uh, and sympathetic um, uh, to the point of perhaps a, a Sinophile, Uh, in terms of his own predispositions. Um, And uh, the issue around that was, of course, that it colored from the beginning public perception on uh, the likely outcome of uh, the investigation itself that Mr. Johnson was going to conduct, um, irrespective of how he would go about conducting that uh, investigation. So that, I guess, for the broader sort of context Uh, of the spectacle that we have been presented with over the past few days. What are the potential drawbacks of not conducting a public inquiry into allegations of foreign interference in Canadian elections and society, as recommended by Special Rapporteur David Johnson? And what happens now? Well, I think we might ask how he arrived at that conclusion. So I think there's two key elements to that. One is he construed his mandate as narrowly as possible. That is to say, the case that myself and others have made for public inquiry was precisely to have uh, a broader sense of activities in place and whether our national security um, posture uh, 
um, in particular when it comes to foreign interference in general, but interference in our election is sufficiently robust. Instead, Mr. Johnston uh, interpreted his mandate as narrowly as possible, taking effectively the allegations that had been leveled in um, uh, reporting by the Globe and Mail and by Global News, um, and appears to have gone to the agencies, to the Privy Council office, to the Prime Minister's office, and perhaps a few other folks, uh, and asked them whether they believe those allegations to be uh, true and accurate or not. Um, and we know the answer that he got. Um, we can take the, him at his word and say that he did his job thoroughly, or we can see this as a tautology where the uh, findings were a foregone conclusion. The other surprising element about the way Mr. Johnston interpreted his mandate is, of course, that uh, the allegations about interference disproportionately affected, if you want in quotation marks, one victim. Uh, that is to say, the Conservative Party um, and some of their candidates. It's important to state that the, that, that the leaders, both present and previous of the Conservative Party, uh, have never delegitimized uh, the election or its outcome per se. Rather, they've raised concerns about a number of their candidates and some of the practices that were alleged. Yet, Mr. Johnston appears not to have made an effort. You would think that if you're having this sort of investigation, the first thing you'd want to do uh, is you want to talk to the, in quotation marks, victim. You want to talk to the people who feel that they have been harmed and get their perception of matters. In part, so you could then make a case that perhaps they misperceived uh, the issues, they misinterpreted, or that the facts just simply don't line up with the way that they see the world. Uh, yet, um, if uh, uh, statements uh, by the former leader of the Conservative Party are to be believed, and there's no reason why we shouldn't, given that he has made these statements in public and in writing, uh, Mr. Johnston came to him last. It gave him two days notice. Uh, and by the time Mr. Johnston showed up in his office, it was clear that the report was already in translation. So the report had already been finalized. Uh, in other words, it is clear that Mr. Johnston ha had no interest in uh, engaging with the perspective of the alleged victims in, uh, in, in this um, supposed foreign interference in our democratic institutions. So on the one hand, then we have a rapporteur who at least in public perception, is not independent, um, is friendly to China, is friendly to the prime minister, and uh, who uh, wouldn't give the other victim an opportunity to voice their concerns and the evidence that they had gathered. At that point, we have to ask how serious really is this entire undertaking? Um, and was it really a fatuous exercise, um, simply trying to reinforce a narrative I also have serious concerns about the method that Mr. Johnston used, um, uh, having read the report uh, and the little bit that we can infer from the method. Uh, it appears that there is substantial amounts of confirmation bias in the report. Uh, and it would also appear that um, usual methods of social science inquiry, especially qualitative in inquiry, um, were not followed. And so as far as I can read the report, um, if that had been submitted in my second year social science methods class, uh, the report would not have passed muster. Uh, but we can only hope that perhaps in the um, interest of time, Mr. Johnston didn't feel it necessary to lay out um, the lengths to which he went to and that perhaps my impression uh, is wrong and that perhaps when we receive a fuller accounting of his work in the fall, Mr. Johnston will do what any good professor should do and clearly lay out his method and demonstrate that his method is actually robust um, in terms of the uh, uh, to justify and rationalize the uh, conclusions and findings that he reached uh, rather than um, constructing um, a conclusion based on the findings and evidence uh, that happened to tautologically uh, feed into preconceived notions of what the preferred narrative uh, would have been from the people that tasked him with this exercise in the first place. What measures uh, do you think can be taken to address the serious gaps identified in the way intelligence is communicated from security agencies to government departments? Yeah, look, I think that's a great question. And it's surprising that, yes, on the one hand, Mr. Johnston finds this as a serious fault. Uh, on the other hand, you would think that Mr. Johnston, as a 
uh, former governor general would have pointed out that our Westminster parliamentary system is premised um, on the concept of ministerial responsibility, where ultimately ministers are responsible for their departments and what happens in their departments. And yet, of course, um, we know that in this particular government, um, when things go pear-shaped, there has been a predisposition to blaming the civil service rather than the minister taking responsibility. What is transpiring here are relations within the government's, the prime minister's own department. That is to say the Privy Council office, uh, where there may have been alleged breakdowns in communication in paperwork, and perhaps also breakdowns in the communication between the Privy Council office and the prime minister's office. Now, regardless of whether there was a breakdown or not, ultimately it means what Mr. Johnson's finding is that the prime minister needs to take responsibility for what happened here. Because if there was a breakdown, as Mr. Johnson finds, then it's ultimately the prime minister who's responsible for his department. And yet so far, I have seen no willingness by the prime minister to actually take responsibility for what is transpiring in his department and keep on blaming everybody but himself. And I find this a little bit puzzling because this is uh, a government that came to power saying they were going to do business differently. Um, on which they were elected. And yet this is the most centralized government in terms of decision-making that this country has ever known. And so when things go wrong, then surprisingly, it seems to be everybody else's fault, except for the prime minister and his extremely centralized decision-making. And so in my view, we can sort of have it both ways, that on the one hand, we wanna make all the decisions but then in the end, we're not responsible for any of the decisions. And when things go wrong, it's everybody else's fault. And so I think at some point here, the government actually needs to be held to account um, simply on the principles of the actual findings of Mr. Johnson, that in terms of ministerial responsibility and the response we've gotten so far from the government are deeply troubling in terms of the government not living up to its basic Westminster parliamentary constitutional responsibilities. Dr. Luprecht, you've been great. As we close out this interview, I'm wondering if you have any final words or, or final thoughts to impart on our audience. So one might ask why it is that Mr. Johnston let himself be dragged into this mess to begin with. This is a man who had an exceptionally distinguished career, um, Harvard educated, uh, the youngest dean of law at McGill University, very successfully ran two of the most distinguished universities in the country, McGill and Waterloo, became governor general. Why would he let himself be drawn into what was clearly in the way it was set up, uh, a rather um, partisan and partial undertaking uh, from the outset? Why did he not frame this um, as um, that if he was going to get involved, uh, it was going to be on the premise of, on the one hand, maximizing his legitimacy in terms of buying from the opposition, um, and on the other hand, uh, making sure that he interprets his mandate um, as broadly as necessary rather than as narrowly as possible. And so what I find puzzling here is that, of course, um, we have um, a senior distinguished gentlemen from the Laurentian elites um, who effectively, if you look at the people who are being defended, uh, is defending a host of other um, white males, all of whom are also associated with the Laurentian elites, uh, everyone from the prime minister to um, um, uh, previous liberal ambassadorial appointments to China, uh, whether that's John McCallum or Dominic Barton. And so I find it a little bit surprising that for a government that makes such a big deal about um, EDI and diversity and so forth, that what this report ultimately reinforces for me is white privilege. And that this report was ultimately about um, white male privileged elites, Laurentian elites in this country, um, when they were being asked to be transparent and accountable to the Canadian public, um, finding for themselves that there's nothing to see here and nothing to investigate here. Um, and that certainly the Canadian public should not be asking any questions um, about the elites and how they've been running both this government and their relationships with China over the last 40 years. Uh, and so if nothing else, I find a considerable dissonance here between the narrative that this part the government likes to put out in terms of its inclusivity and that when it is ultimately challenged on the way things are done, 
it is quite happy uh, to um, protect and uh, defend uh, its own white male privilege um, uh, without accountability transparency to um, the Canadian public. Dr. Luprecht, thank you for providing such astute analysis. Looking forward to having you on again in the future. Take care. Arthur, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. It's great to have you on. Let's dive right in. What are your thoughts about Mr. Johnson's decision not to call a public inquiry? And what do you believe are the most significant takeaways from his report? What happens next? First of all, I have immense respect for Mr. Johnson. I think that this is a distinguished Canadian who has served this country remarkably well in many different capacities, not least of which is Governor General of, of Canada. So uh, he is a man of impeccable integrity, and I, I have to put that out there. But I, I also disagree with his, his conclusion, because at the end of the day, it's not about, about him or what the prime minister thinks of him or even what I think of him. It's what uh, whether or not he has the, the required credibility across as broad a cross-section of Canadians as possible to draw certain conclusions and to, to undertake certain activities. And the fact that we have in Canada all, all official opposition parties in the House of Commons um, calling for an independent inquiry, I think, tells us that we, uh, we need one. Because at the end of the day, as both uh, Mr. Johnson himself said during his press conference uh, releasing the report, and as the Prime Minister said when, uh, when commenting on it, democracy is about trust. And with democracy, we need as broad a consensus as possible in order to restore Canadians' confidence in the institutions that are there to support it. And unfortunately, and unfairly, Mr. Johnson, I don't think, has that broad base support required, and that's why I think an independent inquiry is needed. So in, in terms of takeaways, uh, I think that, so that was question one. <laughs> in terms of, of takeaways, I think that Mr. Johnson, like I have no reason to doubt uh, his, his analysis of what he saw uh, and uh, in, in terms of, of drawing broad conclusions about uh, the, the leaked document. So I think that, you know, uh, an inquiry, though, will be able to be more robust, more comprehensive in its investigation of those findings. But I have no reason to doubt his, uh, his you know, again, his integrity in, in drawing those conclusions. But again, I don't think that's uh, that's the point. The last piece that, that that I think is really important are his observations about the security and intelligence community and the resilience and robustness of the systems that are meant to, to serve uh, Canadian decision makers. And in there, I completely agree with him. And in fact, it's an observation I've had for many, many years, uh, is that the mechanisms and the processes of ensuring that the information goes from intelligence collectors and assessors through to policy makers and decision makers is broken. Uh, we do not have an effective intelligence culture in this country. Uh, our, our systems of making sure that the right people get the right information at the right time to make decisions in the national interest is broken and has not been invested in in an appropriate way for many years. And I'm glad that he's shining the light on it and hope that as we move forward uh, through various process, whether it's in the House of Commons and committee, uh, through Mr. Johnson's you know, public consultations, or an, uh, if an inquiry is called, that we'll spend more time looking at that uh, at those systems to ensure that Canada has a robust system uh, of making sure that intelligence is not only collected, but that it's consumed. And finally, that it's used. Uh, we don't collect intelligence just for, you know, for fun. It's in order to make uh, informed decisions. Well, thanks, Arthur. Building on that, what measures do you think can be taken to address the serious gaps identified in the way intelligence is communicated from security agencies to government departments? Uh, there's, a, there's a range of measures that I think can and should be taken. Number one, I think that there needs to be a centralized approach to the distribution of intelligence. Right now, uh, I think it really is left up to the various organizations across uh, across government uh, to make sure that uh, consumers of intelligence reach receive their uh, their product. Um, I used to be as the as the uh, director general of intelligence operations at Communication Security Establishment, and later as the associate ADM there, uh, the client relations officers, which are the you know one of the tools that make sure that clients receive uh, intelligence. They do bring other uh, agencies' information to uh, the attention of, of, of senior clients, but I, I don't think that that's appropriate. I really do think that we need a more robust central function here. I think uh, 
uh, like in the United States, where we have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, I think we need a similar function here in Canada. I think that the Office of the National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister is too small, too weak, uh, and uh, has to be far more robust in ensuring that there is a common picture that's presented to uh, uh, to uh, consumers of intelligence. And, and I also think that we need to have far more uh, training uh, for senior leaders uh, right across the government of Canada. Uh, too often, the first time that, that a senior public servant receives intelligence, is, specifically if they're not in uh, the national security, intelligence, and defense community, the first time they'll ever see intel is usually at the ADM or even at the deputy minister level. And that's that's just nuts. Uh, you know, I've been at too many briefings for deputy ministers where that was, you know, the first time that they've ever been exposed uh, to highly classified information. And by then, their information management habits are already, uh, you know, fixed, uh, trying to decide how and when uh, uh, to use, uh, you know, classified information, it becomes, you know, unclear to them because they don't have that experience. So we need to build this into the training of executives, at, you know, across government, and we need to build that far more robust intelligence culture, again, across government. What are the ethical and legal implications uh, from your perspective of leaking secret intelligence, and how does it affect well, our ability to gather intelligence and collaborate with our allies? Oh, leaking intelligence is terrible. It's it's absolutely uh, you know there's a reason why it's it's uh, it's criminalized uh, in terms of the Security of Information uh, Act. Uh, you know we uh, within the intelligence community uh, are given exceptional powers uh, to use very sophisticated techniques in the national interest. Those techniques and those powers are exceptional, and we need to make sure that we, we manage those effectively. That's why there's a broad compliance regime in terms of how we, we behave and how we act in the national interest and the use and exercise of those powers. Uh, part of that is, a, is, is when we become uh, members of the community and we have access to the information, and even more so when we are uh, within the system in terms of collectors and those who pro provide analysis and assessment, we swear an oath of secrecy secrecy, because the consequences of, uh, of divulging that information are very high. Uh, they're high in terms of our sources and techniques. They're also high in terms of the, the consequences are high in terms of individuals that may be the subject of those disclosures. So if, if for example, as has, has happened in, in this specific case around foreign interference, the names of specific individuals are associated with intelligence collection, they have not been granted the right of due process. They have been already aff uh, negatively affected in terms of their reputations, and they have been, uh, you know, they have not been given the presumption of innocence and all of the the robust protections in terms of our individual rights that exist uh, in, uh, in in Canadian law when you are, for example, uh, accused for, uh, by uh, by by criminal standards. Uh, there is no evidentiary standard for uh, for uh, for intelligence, and that's what one of the reasons why it needs to be appropriately protected and constrained. So I'm very uh, uh, concerned about those leaks. Um, I'm also concerned about uh, about the international aspects of it from Five Eyes, but to be blunt, less so. Um, you know, all of you know one of the things that's supremely clear and unfortunate is that all Five Eyes. Uh, have uh, illicit disclosures. You know, our, our, our U.S. friends right now are dealing with a very, very troubling uh, case uh, in Massachusetts about broad-based uh, intelligence and, and huge volumes of intelligence that's been leaked. So, you know, all of us are, are super aware of the challenges and uh, many of us go, you know, therefore the you know, grace of God go I in terms of uh, illicit disclosures. It happens and that's why there needs to be investigation, uh, due process, and if appropriate, sanctions for those kinds of activities. Broadly, has the media acted responsibly when reporting on matters of foreign interference? And can you comment on the potential risks of relying on media reporting as a primary source of information on these allegations, especially considering the limitations of partial intelligence? Uh, you know, media is going to do its job, uh, which is to report information that they think is uh, is in the public interest. So, uh, you know, I actually don't have a big bone to pick. Uh, with uh, with uh, with the media outlets that have been reporting on information that they've received, I think that they're doing their job. The problem is is that in Canada, uh, 
uh, we don't have, again, a good firm understanding of what intelligence is. It goes back to that question of intelligence culture. Uh, you know, if I think that that there is a lack of understanding within government circles around how to use and what intelligence is, it's even worse uh, in, in, the, in the public domain. And the media are just a creature of that public environment. And I actually think that this is a, an, an own goal on the part of the national security and intelligence community. We have for far, far too long uh, you know, been um, you know, hidden. Uh, we've behaved in a in a way that's overly secretive uh, and non-transparent. And I think that we are seeing those uh, you know those particular bad habits coming home to roost. If we had a better and more transparent engagement with media and Canadians on these questions, I think that both media and Canadians would be more informed about what the value of intelligence is and how to appropriately contextualize it. We haven't done that, and we're paying the consequence. Well, Arthur, thanks for accepting my invitation to speak today. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Before we wrap this up, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts or parting words for our audience. Well, no, I'm just, uh, I think that, that this is an important issue. And I think that many uh, folks in your audience, I think, are, are engaged uh, current and former members of the national security, intelligence, and defense community. I think that they have a role to play in building that better understanding of, of what national security, intelligence, and defense is. And I think that that spending that time, whether or not it's as you know engaged with, with media or just in terms of the various uh, you know circles that they have uh, of influence, I think that they should dedicate some time in, in explaining the system so that we have a far better and more robust understanding of the role national security and intelligence plays in Canadian society. Thank you, Arthur. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Dr. Janot, thanks for joining us for the podcast once again. To kick things off, what are your thoughts about Mr. Johnson's decision not to call a public inquiry? And what do you believe are the most significant takeaways from his report? Well, I, I was somewhat surprised in the sense that I, I, I'm always reluctant to, to get into predictions, but I was um, I, I thought he would suggest an inquiry. That being said, I did, I, I did not think that an inquiry was the, the, really the best way to go in the sense that not so much because of the classified dimension, which he emphasized a lot. I don't fully agree with that logic. My point was more that with all the other processes going on, uh, NSI COP, the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, and CIRA, the review agency, a number of parliamentary committees, a number of other mechanisms going on, in that context, I, I, I thought that a, I, I was very skeptical, to put it that way, that a, a commission of inquiry uh, would really have a significant value added. In a world where nothing else would have been going on, I would have been more convinced. Given everything else, I'm, I, I didn't see it as very useful. How would you assess the government's efforts to address China's interference efforts, as well as the efforts by other foreign states? Why are we seemingly so far behind our allies? Is it possible that this is a step in the right direction? So, I would just be careful with the, 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 the way you phrase the question on us being so far behind our allies. All of our allies are grappling with this. We're not doing an especially good job. I'm not saying that at all to, to, as, a, you know, as, a, as a caveat to defend the government. I think the government's performance on foreign interference and national security in general has not been very good. And I've, I've written a fair bit about this. Uh, but we do have to be careful not to idealize or romanticize what our allies are doing. They are struggling too in various ways. In some fronts, they're doing better, but not always and not systematically. And when they do, maybe not by that much. Um, so overall, I think it's it's quite clear that this government has neglected national security issues. Is is the rapporteur, Mr. Johnston, right to say that he, there is no indication of, of willful ignorance of Chinese interference for political gains? Very hard to say without access to the to the, the intelligence, but but uh, I, I, I'm willing to, to accept that. But it doesn't excuse the fact that overall, it is very clear that this government has neglected foreign interference, not just by China, by others too, by Iran in particular, something that I've looked at, uh, and, and other threats, uh, economic espionage and, and, and cyber and so on. 
Overall, uh, I do think there is a very slow, too slow, but real trend of steady progress on some of these fronts, whether it's foreign interference on Iran. We saw a number of packages announced uh, during the, the uh, fall of last year. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw CSIS and CSC uh, make a lot of progress in working against economic espionage, for example, the theft of intellectual property in the context of you know, biomedical research and so on. Is the progress as fast as it needs to be? I, I would definitely make the case that no, uh, but I would say that there is a bottom line or a baseline of, of slow progress. You stated that you don't think uh, holding a public inquiry would be the most effective way to uh, address this issue of foreign interference. Do you think there's any potential drawbacks or consequences of not holding a pub public inquiry into the allegations? Uh, yes, there are, of course. Uh, these things are never you know, black or white with all the pros on one side and all the cons on the other side. A public inquiry would have had some benefits. Uh, I just find that the, those who, um, a lot of those, I shouldn't generalize to everybody, who have been making the case for a public inquiry have uh, had inflated expectations of what a public inquiry could do uh, because a lot of the information would be, would be classified. Uh, not a reason not to do it, but a reality. Um, and, and, you know, one argument that I hear a lot is that a public inquiry would restore trust in, in our democratic institutions. I would like that to be true. I don't think it would be. Um, I think a variety of other, other uh, initiatives that are ongoing and CIRA and SICA, parliamentary testimonies, we'll see what exactly happens with the public hearings that Mr. Johnston committed to. Uh, are all of these magic recipes? Of course not. There's no such thing. Uh, but can they can they do something? Yes, I think they can. You know, the, a public inquiry, whatever form it would have taken, would have been a huge drain on resources, um, and and it would have been redundant uh, relative to a lot of what these other initiatives are doing. So, not at all saying that it would have been useless. It's just that I I don't see how it would have really made a game changing difference. Or game changing is too high a bar, but a significant difference. How can the Canadian intelligence system address issues of decentralization, siloing, and the overwhelming volume of intelligence to enhance its efficiency and effectiveness? A, a very uh, tall order, perhaps, to answer. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, you know, of course, the partisan politics and all the bickering around by both the government and the opposition, of course, it matters. Uh, but, but as an academic, what I'm interested in is, okay, but beyond that, concretely what needs to be done to make our response better. Uh, and one thing that the Johnston report, the first report, interim report, uh, released uh, uh, a few days ago, highlights is problems in the machinery of government in how intelligence is produced, how it's disseminated, and how it's consumed. I think there's a lot to take issue with, with what he said, a lot of the details, a lot of the things that he said in the media or in his press conference since. I don't agree with the detail. That being said, he is completely right, and, and I hope that there is much more focus on that, on the machinery dimension. So what can be done? Uh, we need a stronger center. Uh, we need the National Security and Intelligence Advisor to be a stronger position. It's not to say anything about the personality now or in previous cases who've been in that position. It's the position itself is not strong enough in terms of resources and ability to coordinate the work of the community. I absolutely think we need a National Security Committee of Cabinet uh, that would be much more forward-looking, uh, much more strategic as opposed to the current system, which is ad hoc and much more reactive. That would allow more strategic planning. Um, we need, and, and, and a stronger National Security Intelligence Advisor would be better positioned to support that Cabinet Committee. We need uh, other mechanisms to break the silos in a community that remains much more insular, uh, much more reluctant to share information internally, uh, very reluctant to share information with other partners in the federal government, and reluctant to share information outside the government, whether it's with provincial and municipal governments, that matters when you deal with foreign interference, with civil society, again, that matters, and the general public as a whole. Uh, beyond that, we need a lot more transparency. This is a point that I always like to, to emphasize. And, and well, I mean, I could go on for a, for a long time, but the last point that I'll mention here is resources. Um, the intelligence community in Canada is overstretched. Uh, it is uh, suffering from a shortage of human resources. It is suffering from a shortage of financial and other resources. So any discussion going forward needs to bring into a very monetary financial aspect of resources. 
exactly how much more is necessary, hard for me to say on the outside, but I don't see how they can do everything we want them to do with current resources, given how overstretched they are now as we speak. I'm wondering if you would be willing to comment on uh, what you believe are the ethical and legal implications of leaking secret intelligence. Uh, are leaks ever warranted or morally justifiable? And is there any justification uh, for the leaks that have happened over the past few months in terms of uh, foreign interference? So that's a tough question. I, and I'm, I'm not going to go on the legal side of it, because I think that that even most lawyers have a hard time uh, grappling with the very technical sides of you know the Security of Information Act and so on. So I'll, I'll put aside the legal dimension. From a political and ethical perspective, ultimately, I disagree with the leaks. I think that the current leaks in this context, I think it's a breach of everything that public servants should stand for. Um, I was a public servant for 11 years. I take these, and technically I still am as an academic for the for the interior government, but I was at National Defense for 11 years in the policy group. I take these, these values of service uh, extremely seriously. Uh, so there's a dilemma here. If you think there's a problem, uh, if you think there's a legal or other problem, if you think that you have no avenues to raise issues, should you leak in some circumstances? In extreme cases, theoretically, I think so. In this case, I do not think it is justified. I don't think it's even close to being justified. There is a point to be made that we have weak whistleblower protection in this country. That's true. And that, that's a problem that I think we, we might want to address. In this case, I don't think it applies. A, the amount of leaks have been damaging in terms of the detail, uh, the operational detail uh, of, of a lot of the assessments that were shared, assessments from PCO and, and other documents from CSIS um, that shouldn't have been made to the public. Um, what else could have been done? I think the leaker, leakers, whoever it is, whoever they are, uh, could have used other means by, by going to their MPs, uh, by going to the media without leaking that much information. Um, but, but there's a huge stretch uh, that, 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 that I think is, is being made here in terms of justifying what is necessary and what here is, is not necessary in terms of leaking highly classified information. There is a problem with foreign interference in this country. There is absolutely legitimate criticism that the government hasn't been doing enough. Um, but I don't think when you weigh the pros and cons that, that, that leaking this extent of classified information is, is justified. Dr. Jeannot, you've been great as always. Before we wrap up this interview, do you have any final thoughts or words to impart on our listeners? Uh, you know, I, I think in this country, we, we have a, 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 we're very lucky in many ways. Uh, we are a very safe country. This is something that I think we tend to forget. It is true that our security environment is getting worse. Foreign interference by China is one threat, by other countries is another threat. Economic espionage, cyber, climate change, and so on. We need to catch up. We have a lot of, a lot of catching up to do. But I really take issue with, uh, and, and so, yes, catching up. Yes, criticism of this government for not doing enough. I fully agree, and I've written on that a fair bit. Um, but I, I take issue with some of the criticism that we've heard from the media, from the opposition, from ver various quarters in the this week, but over the past few weeks. Uh, the situation is not catastrophic. Uh, and, and yes, the problems that Mr. Johnston raised in his report are, are, are real. Um, but the idea that the system is completely broken and that we are in massive trouble, I think, is, is a stretch. We have problems. Uh, we are not doing enough to deal with them. Uh, but th there's a level of nuance that I think uh, w would be helpful in, in the debate. Well, Dr. Jeannot, thanks for providing this excellent analysis. Thank you for accepting my invitation, and I look forward to having more conversations with you in the future. Thank you. Take care. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute's Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca, or you can subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next week.